Holiday season is going to be soon upon us, and I know many of you are researching travel and are frankly nervous about it. And when I get nervous about something, I tend to research it excessively. And the good news is, is I've already researched this topic. So everything you've ever wanted to know about traveling in a plus size body, I have put it together into a series of videos. Now I shared these originally on my travel channel, but I figured with the increase of questions I've had about traveling, I thought it deserved a home here as well. So here is all the information I have about traveling in a plus size body. I hope it helps some of you feel more prepared and a little bit more at ease when traveling this holiday season. If I miss something, cause I probably did, please leave it down in the comment section and I'll make sure to do the research for you in future videos. I hope you enjoyed this compilation of travel tips when traveling in a plus size body. So this is our first ever video for our Glitter and Lasers Adventures channel and I'm super excited because I'm gonna be answering all your burning questions about travel. So I gathered all the questions you guys have asked me over the years about travel, put them together and created a foolproof guide to traveling in a bigger body. I figured this was the best way to kick this channel off and also it becomes a resource. So whenever anybody has questions about these very things, I have them addressed in this video first and foremost because I wanna show you that everybody can see the world. So. Let's start at the very beginning. And this is a phrase you're gonna hear me say a lot throughout this video is that planning is key. Planning to me is the most important part because it will greatly affect whether you have a good trip or a bad trip. And that's not because you're planning, you know, adventures or that you can't change your plans once you're in country, but it's gonna just give you that sense of comfort. And I think a lot of our discomfort in traveling in bigger bodies really is more due to our anxiety than the actual country itself not being accessible. And that's been my personal experience. And I think that when I talk to other travelers, it's similar. Sure, there's always gonna be an idiot that says something to you. And that doesn't matter what country, state, or region you are in, there will always be someone because there's always someone in the world. But you have to make the choice to not listen to that one person and instead focus on all the amazing things that are around you. So let's talk about planning. First, let's start with the hardest thing, planning your flight. Now, I probably get more questions about flying than I do anything else. And the first thing I'm gonna say is, there is a ton of resources out there about plane seats, about armrests, about all the different information about the plane. Everything you need to know to decide whether you need one seat or two seats, whether you'd be more comfortable in economy or business class. Personally, I buy two seats, and I'll tell you why I do. Sometimes I fit fine, but in the rare chance that I don't, I don't wanna deal with it. I don't want the stress. So I've just decided for my mental health, two economy seats is the best way to travel for me. I will say if you're flying Southwest and purchase two seats, they will actually credit you the second seat back once you arrive at your destination. You just need to call in. All other airlines, it's kind of a different process depending on the airline, but typically it's you book your ticket and then you call the airline and book the secondary ticket for the extra seat. Some of them also have codes like EXST as your middle name to do that as well on your own. So it's just gonna depend on which airline you choose to fly and where you're headed. But research the seats. Now the sites I like to use to research are Seat Guru, and then also the airlines themselves have tons of details about their aircrafts. Personally, I think United's are the most robust. They'll tell you the pitch, they'll tell you the width, and they'll also tell you whether the armrests go up on each side. Now the armrests are important because if you're in between or maybe you don't have money to spring for an extra seat, you can always purchase an aisle seat with an armrest that goes up. It's gonna give you a little bit more room. You're gonna have to have the bar down when you take off and when you land, but for the rest of your flight, that can be up and give you a little bit more comfort. So first and foremost, plan what seat you get on the airplane so it's not a surprise when you get there. Next, you gotta plan your activities. And all I'm gonna say is know your boundaries. I think a lot of people get over ambitious on holiday and they end up ruining their vacation by doing something that's just a little bit out of their comfort zone. I am chronically doing this to myself so I have no room to talk, but sometimes I'm on vacation to push myself so it just depends on what you're going for. Also look for things like weight limits and things that are required on trips. I will say some of the weight limits are literally just a proxy for abilities. So the example I always give people is, 
I wanted to go snorkeling when I was in Belize and I saw that there was a weight limit of like 250 pounds. And I was like, that seems a little bizarre. You don't need to like be a certain weight to snorkel. You just need to know how to swim. So I called the service and I inquired about the weight limit and they said, well, we have a little bit of a concern because we've had trouble with people not being able to get on the boat afterwards. So they had no problem what weight you were. They were just creating a proxy weight to prevent the situation to happen, which is where they couldn't get the woman back on the boat. So again, here's where knowing your abilities and I knowing I have like pretty strong upper arm strength, that's not gonna be an issue for me. Even though I'm over their weight limit, I'm gonna be fine on that activity. So things to think about when you're planning and also always call the place to find out more information. Just because it says it's not gonna work for you doesn't mean it's actually not going to. If you really wanna do it, you probably can find a way to do it if you call and have a discussion with them. I always like to, as like another level of this, is to plan activities I just like have to see and do and activities that would be nice to do. That way, if I push myself on an activity that I really wanted to do, I can opt to have a lazy rest of the day. Sometimes people go on trips and they pack way too much in and what ends up happening is they end up getting hurt or they end up not actually enjoying their trip. So as a bigger lady, sometimes I don't think about how humidity and altitude and other things might affect me. And since sometimes you don't really know those things until you're in the location, that's why planning like this is really helpful. Plan your transportation. So aside from the aircraft, you might have buses, you might have boats, you might have other things. Again, this is important to know how big are those seats? Are you gonna need extra space? Communicate those with your tour providers before you even go so you're not trying to be crammed into a bus in a place you don't really fit because you didn't tell them that you would like a little extra room. Again, it's just communicating and planning, that's all it is. The last thing I'm gonna say in the planning process is to learn a bit of the language of where you're traveling. It goes a long way in showing the people in that country that you value and appreciate their culture. Additionally, when you need help and you start by trying to speak to them in their native language, they're more likely to help you. Um, a story that my friend told me, she's a French teacher, she said that the reason some French people think Americans are rude is because when a French person goes into a business, the first thing they do is say hello. In America, the first thing we do when we go to a business is just kind of say our order. So right off the bat, not knowing that cultural difference You've already put yourself in the position of being viewed as rude because you're not aware of the culture and the language of the country that you're visiting. Now let's talk about packing. Packing is critical when you're plus size because you don't have the option of rebuying in country most of the times. Yes, there are always plus stores. I found plus size stores in Thailand and in India all over, but a lot of times you have to have those items shipped to you or they may not have a ton of stock available. So I like to think about what are my essentials. And for me, the things I found I can never get in another country are underwear, swimsuits, and pants. So I make sure that I pack extra of those items because I know I can't replace them in country. I will say you can always find an oversized t-shirt. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, there will always be an oversized t-shirt for you. I literally have gotten a t-shirt in almost every country I've been to without a problem. The other thing to think about pancaking too is putting most of those items that you know are critical that you can't replace in your carry-on. You can buy more skincare, you can buy more makeup, you can buy all of those things. But if your luggage was to get lost in country and you didn't have underwear and you didn't have pants, you're probably gonna have a really hard time having fun on vacation. So make sure whatever's in your carry-on are those items that are essential to you. One item that's essential to me that I actually carry in my backpack and at arm's reach at all times is chafing stick. We've talked about this before in terms of like swimming, keeping the chafe from in between your legs, but just in traveling, it can be a godsend. Even on log flights, I like to put it in just because sometimes your thighs are sandwiched together and it gets a little hot and you know, it just gets friction, right? <laughs> between these hot thighs. So with that friction, having that chafe stick on protects you and makes sure that you don't ruin your vacation by taking a long flight. So just be prepared and always have chafe stick. The last item I'm gonna talk about in relation to packing is shoes. So I have a rule, unless I'm shooting a lookbook somewhere, I only bring shoes that I can walk a mile in. And that's because you can't take a bunch of shoes or you really shouldn't take a bunch of shoes when you're traveling. They just take up so much space in a suitcase. So I like to stick to my Tevas, my Hoka's and my Vionics. Those are shoes that I know will support my feet no matter how far I walk. And I can wear them with lots of different outfits. So I try to stick to the shoes that I know are gonna support me best and leave the more fashion forward items for events and stuff at home. 
Oftentimes I do throw one fun pair in there if we have a night out or something like that, but it's not an essential and you don't have to have it. Now we're gonna talk about actually getting on a plane and flying somewhere. And this is the point where most people have the most anxiety. This is where I've had the most questions. So the first thing I heard from a lot of you is like, what do I do when I'm walking down the aisles? Am I gonna be too big for the aisles? What's it gonna be like? Here's my pro tip. If you are nice, and the key to this is being nice, that's an overarching theme here. If you go to the front desk, if you arrive a little early and ask to pre-board, they will let you pre-board. If you've purchased two tickets, you automatically get to pre-board, but if you're just nervous and wanna have that experience on your own and have only purchased one seat, just ask to pre-board. That way you don't have to worry about anyone around you, you can walk through, and you can do our second thing, which is ask for a seatbelt extender more privately, right? Since nobody else is on the plane, other than maybe the couple other people that pre-boarded, some who might be in a similar situation to you, you can conveniently ask for a seatbelt extender, and it's really not a big deal because it's you know private. I don't really care if people see I've asked for a seatbelt extender, but I know that's sensitive for some of you. So if it is, that's an easy way to kill two birds with one stone. You can walk however you need to walk to the seat without anybody watching, and you can ask for that seatbelt extender without any pressure. Now, one thing I will say about the seatbelt extender, don't buy it. I see all these people saying like, buy a seatbelt extender. Do not do that. Every plane's seatbelt is different, and your extender probably will only work once. Literally, I've been on planes about five or six times this year and every single one had a different buckle. So it's just not worth your money. It's better for you to get more comfortable asking for a seatbelt extender. They're very readily available at this point than it is for you to buy one. There's three other things that I have not heard anyone talk about that have affected me personally on flights, so I'm gonna talk about them. The first is if you buy two seats, especially when they're smaller, more regional flights, Sometimes the buckle on the seat has a sharp edge. I've literally ripped my pants, actually I ripped them on my way to Orlando, from these little sharp points. So I always bring a sweatshirt or something that I can throw over that point so I don't cut my pants and so it doesn't like jab me the entire flight. Now this is more just on the regional flights, but it is really irritating and if you didn't know it was gonna be there, it can kind of be a mood killer. The second thing is bathrooms. Now I know a lot of people just hold it, but when you're on a very long flight, that's not really an option. So for long haul flights, most of them, and I say most because it's technically all of them should have it, but we all know people break the rules. Most long haul flights will have a handicapped bathroom. These bathrooms are much larger, considerably larger than the smaller bathrooms you might be familiar with on regional flights. And those are the best places to go to the bathroom. And, and frankly, everybody wants to go to those bathrooms. So if you ever see a woman like go into the bathroom and come out like in a completely new outfit, she went to the handicapped bathroom, there's enough room to like literally change your whole look and open your suitcase in there. So that's the best place to be <laughs> in a flight is that handicapped bathroom. And just ask where it is. It's usually in the middle of the flight and on the left-hand side, but some planes are different. And the last thing we're gonna talk about in relation to all of this is if you're on a long haul flight, your feet are probably gonna swell. I would recommend getting some compression socks. I really like Vim and Vigor. If you have plantar fasciitis like I do, I will link a pair that I like that just go over the foot and the ankle, and those have been a godsend for me in keeping swelling down. You don't wanna start your trip off being swollen. It's not fun. So the easiest thing to do is be proactive, use those compression socks when you're in flight. Now we're at our destination and we get somewhere and we're uncomfortable, right? Either the chair isn't right, or maybe the tour guide's walking too fast, or you just feel out of sorts. Advocate for yourself. And I know that's scary, by the way. I know that like, I just said that off the cuff, like advocate for yourself, but you have to. You have to advocate for yourself. In a video that you guys are gonna see shortly where we did like an AI inspired trip, I went to a restaurant and they brought out the devil plastic chair. And if you're a plus size person, you know about the, the saga that is the white plastic chair. And I was, I literally just turned to the lady running the restaurant. I said, ma'am, I am so excited to eat here, but I don't want my memory of this restaurant to be me breaking this chair. <laughs> is there any way I could have one of the chairs from the inside brought outside? And she was like, sure, no problem. She thought it was hilarious, kind of laughed too, because the reality is it's like those fears that you have People in that country also have those fears, same fears as you. It's not like you as a plus size person have traveled somewhere else and no one else feels the same way you do. So you might as well just advocate for yourself. I have never been in a situation traveling 
where I haven't said something and the problem was immediately fixed. Literally, especially around things regarding my weight because most times hotels are just uninformed. They just don't know what to do. So if you tell them what to do, they'll just do it. A lot of people feel like, oh, I'm, I'm being difficult if I ask for help. Look, you paid for this trip just like everybody else and it's okay to ask for help and support in being able to enjoy that experience just like everybody else. Also, sometimes these hotels and locations just don't think about plus size travelers because maybe they've never visited before. So by you asking, you're also creating a solution for someone else down the path. So I've been locations where I know somebody else has asked for a seat before because they've asked me proactively, hey, would you prefer a different seat? And I don't take that as offensive at all. I think, wow, these people have had a plus size person here before. Great, I don't have to ask for it. So you're creating a culture where those things are expected versus things you have to ask for. And so you're really passing on the ability to travel to somebody else. The last thing I'm gonna say about traveling, and this, this, this is the hardest part, but don't get caught up in what you think people are saying about you. Um, every time I travel somewhere, uh, more unusual, somewhere that maybe people don't travel on an everyday basis, like China or uh, Myanmar or like South America, right? Places that aren't like Cancun or Bahamas, right? People are always like, those people are gonna be so mean to you because you're fat. I'm gonna tell you right here, that has never been my experience. The amount of people who have told me I was gonna have a miserable experience in insert country name because I was overweight, far exceeds the actual bad experiences I have in a country because of my weight. A great example is when I went to China, everybody told me, oh, Chinese people are gonna be very difficult on your weight. They're going to harass you for it. I had zero, zero experiences. And I talk to people, man, like I am out there. I put myself out there. This is my like closing statement, my last words. You will have the vacation you believe you deserve. So if you think that everybody's judging you and hating at you and looking at you, you're gonna see that. And that's all you'll be able to see. But if you're going somewhere and you're thinking about connecting with the culture and getting to know people and seeing great things, that's what you're gonna see and experience. It's your choice. So let the anxiety go. Sure, somebody's gonna say something. As we covered, someone will always say something. But it doesn't matter. You got to get out there. You got to see the world. And that far exceeds what some idiot thinks about your body. And most of the time we think people are, are saying things about us and they're not. They're talking about their coworker or their buddy or their friend. One time I had a person call me big in China and they were saying that I was big and beautiful. And I was like, I am. <laughs> so again, you will have the vacation you choose to have. You will have an experience in the world based on how you see the world. And that's just how it is. So try to keep yourself focused on the good and let all the crap fly away and you'll have an amazing trip. Hey everybody. Now, if you were here, I guess a week and a half ago, you might've seen my travel 101 video. And in that video, I walked you through all of my travel tips and I encourage all of you to leave me questions and comments if I missed anything. And it turns out I, I missed some things. So we're gonna talk about all of those today. And before I get into the rest of the tips and tricks for Travel 102, I wanted to just read some comments that people left on the previous video because I feel like they're just good things to hear and know that you're not alone in traveling and that there's other people who've done it besides me and had a great experience. So I'm just gonna read a couple of those comments and then we'll jump into the next set of advice. So our first comment is from Jade H. She said she traveled to visit family and they took her to a restaurant so she could experience food she'd never experienced before. And the amazing thing is, is that the waiter started to seat them, but he saw that she was plus size and just moved them to a different table where she would be more comfortable. That restaurant, she said, won her heart and her business and just reinforces that there are more kind people out there than mean ones. Sharon Pink left a comment and said, she was horrified the first time she was asked for a seatbelt extender and the steward just went and got it for her. And she realized by asking that first time that she built it up as a huge ask in her head, but it really isn't that big a deal. 
And then our last comment is from Livewire717. And she said that another thing she likes to do is arrive early when traveling. So if there is any problems or issues that arise, you can ask during a lull and you're not, you don't have to feel like a bother. So I thought those were three really great comments from you guys, just reinforcing about what we talked about in the last video and what we're gonna talk about today. Now today is literally 100% from comments on the previous video, things that I also had to research a little bit, some of the things I didn't know. So we're gonna jump right in. The first question I got a couple of times was about TSA. And I'm gonna tell you right now, and I'm gonna, I told you I would always be honest on this channel, that TSA is biased. There was actually a research done by the government accounting office that concluded that the false alarm for passengers with a normal BMI was less than false alarm rates for overweight passengers. Now, there is no such thing as a normal BMI, that's a whole, other conversation, but it does acknowledge in an academic study that if you are plus size, you're more likely to hit the trigger. I feel like there are two ways that we tend to activate the triggers more. First, just bigger hips hitting the sides of an entrance machine, either the mental metal ones or like the one where you go like this. Now in the one where you go like this, I guess it's radiation. I don't know what they're doing, but they're scanning you, right? The wider you stand, the less likely you'll flag it. And if you still flag it, it's probably gonna be in your knees, hips, and arms. I don't know why that is. I don't know why that machine doesn't like get it right, but I am constantly flagged on the back of my knees and my upper arms, no matter how wide I stand. Some of you will be okay just by standing wider, but for a lot of us, you're just gonna have to accept the fact that you're gonna get a pat down. Or there's another option to get TSA, pre-check or global entry. Now TSA pre-check and global entry ensures you don't have to go through this one and you just need to make it through the Mendel gate without touching your sides. This one's perfectly fine. If you do touch your sides, most places will just let you go through again. So those are your options. You can either go know that you're gonna have to stand wide and potentially still get patted down or invest in something like a pre-check and a global entry where you're not gonna have to go through that unit and have a better chance of not flagging it. But we know through research that you're more likely to flag it if you're plus size. The next question we had was about weather delays, mechanical errors, anything that would lead to your flight going out late, stopping early, or uh, getting canceled. And this is another example where I'm just gonna have to be real with you. These occurrences suck no matter what airline you fly and no matter what size you are. It is hard to get on a flight after all of the flights have been canceled. And when you're looking for two seats next to each other, it is harder. The only thing I can say is the more flexible you are with when you can leave, the more likely you can resume your trip in the same manner you planned it. But these are problems. Now, one thing that can help significantly is if you're a frequent flyer. If you are loyal to one or two airlines and you have an issue, they will bump up the service level you get. That's true for any passenger, plus size or not. So for me, I have not had this be a huge problem for me recently because I do hold status on an airline and they usually do accommodate me before people that don't have status. So that's another reason that we'll probably talk about in a later video where if you aren't playing the points game, if you aren't in those loyalty programs, you really are not only missing out on potential free trips in the future, but just extra service that might help make your trip more comfortable. That's a whole other video that I, I will make at some point because I love points. I love them so much. The other thing I will say about weather delays before we move on is be nice. I know I've said that in the last video. I will echo it again here. The nicer you are, the better service you're likely to get. And also there's always extras when there's delays and cancellations that the flight team can give you. And those things typically go to the people that are nicest to them. So hotel vouchers, food vouchers, any type of extra accommodation, that's gonna come from, that's gonna go to people who are nice. That's just the way it works. So be nice. Okay, a big amount of discussion was when to choose first class versus choosing two seats. I personally typically choose two seats. And the reason is, is some first class seats are still really small. And because a lot of times it's cheaper. 
internationally, additionally, in some air airlines, first class is just two seats or a seat in between you and the other passenger. So it actually becomes a better price for the same thing, just in a different class. You're not in the front, 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 front section of the plane. So if you're trying to decide between the two, this is how I typically make the decision. I look at the seat widths, which you can look at Seat Guru or the websites for the airline themselves. I also look at the length of the flight and whether the chair reclines or not. If I'm on a really long flight international, sometimes I'm gonna take that first class seat because I can totally recline and go to sleep, but it is expensive, right? It's way more expensive to fly first class than it is in most cases to buy two seats. Again, sometimes you can find better deals either way. It just, most of the time it's cheaper for two seats and that's why I do it. I also do two seats because several airlines refund you for two seats. We'll talk about which airlines those are in just a little bit. And also sometimes I do two seats because I typically don't love the people in first class. I sat next to a guy in first class who literally had a lesson for me about my weight. And I just feel like sometimes, and this is maybe my own experience, people in first class can be a little bit more judgmental. Um, not necessarily on international trips, but definitely stateside. So that's been my personal experience. So I'm making those choices based on mine. Your experience might be different. When you do purchase two seats, be careful not to book an exit row or a bulkhead seat. Those seats don't have armrests that go up and they are not going to be comfortable. They are a waste of buying a second seat. So don't buy bulkhead, which is that first first seat, and don't buy any of the exit rows because Again, you're not gonna be able to raise that armrest in most flights. Some flights you can, but generally you can't. There's two tips and tricks for finding flights that are affordable that I like to use. I love Google Flights. It's just flights.google.com. Super easy, you can put in where you're going. You can even just put where you're from and see what flights are cheap from around you. It's a great way to find cheap flights. Thick or thin, it's great. You can also put a Chrome extension on that search, which will also overlay the leg room of each flight. So if you're worried about being tall or having extra leg room, I like to use this little extension on top because it gives you exactly how much leg room you're gonna get. And you'll find out it's not all equal. In fact, the seats are closer to similar size than the leg rooms. Some leg rooms are like <laughs> so small and you don't know, you don't know because it varies by plane. The last thing I will say about booking two seats, I saw a lot of concern in the comments about I, what if I book a second seat and then they give it away. If you book two seats, they legally cannot give your second seat away. So if a flight attendant comes to you and says, is this seat open? You just need to say, I've purchased two seats and they should move on. If they push you, that's wrong. That is like literally not legally allowed. So you need to escalate to the more senior person on the team. Oftentimes this just comes from people who are inexperienced flight attendants or have never worked with a person of size before. Additionally, if you're worried about how your airline is going to deal with a person of size, which is anyone who might or might not need a second seat, every airline in the US pretty much has a customer of size policy or makes a statement about when or when not someone should purchase a second seat. So if you're concerned on whether you made the right choice, I would suggest looking at the disabilities page of your US airline to see if they have a customer of size policy and that you're abiding by it. This is just an easy like gut check you can do. Eventually you begin to learn them by the airlines you fly most frequently, but it's always good to just know what's available in terms of resources and what's the protocol for communicating that either you have an extra seat or that you may need extra space. Now we're gonna talk about airlines outside of the US that also offer customer of size policies. Again, if you're not American, this is super helpful. Also, if you're American traveling international, this is super helpful. So I'm trying to make this as international as possible. I am limited to my knowledge and what I could research. I'm sure there are other policies, but I may not be familiar with them. These are the ones I've personally used in the past or are aware of. So the first I'm gonna talk about is Air France. And the thing, thing to notice there is if you need an extra seat, they will discount that seat 25% for you. So it's not a full refund, but they will give you 25% off at purchase. And I believe if the flight's not 
not completely full, you can actually ask for that second seat cost back, um, but it has to be done after the flight is taken. That second seat being refunded is also similar with Alaskan Air. Now I know Alaskan Air is a US airline, but I'm including them because they often don't get discussed and they do fly other places. They will also refund the seat, but after you take the flight. And that's also similar to how Southwest does their customer of size policy, purchase ahead of time, and then you can get the second seat refunded afterwards. So now we're going to talk about two Canada airlines, Air Canada and WestJet. Air Canada will give you a second seat for free. I think you just need to call them or communicate. If it happens during your flight and you didn't prepare for it, you might be asked to take a different flight. So just call ahead. WestJet, it's a little bit different. You have to have a doctor verify that you need a second seat. Honestly, if I were Canadian, I would just fly Air Canada. It just seems like an easier solution than having to Literally, it says WestJet will offer passengers an extra seat for certain medical condition. A doctor is required. I just feel like that is, you know, it's hard enough for me to get access to my doctor for my airline to demand access is, is too much. I'll just take the other Canadian airline. That's my personal opinion, but make your own choices. The last is um, Emirates. And Emirates just launched a new program that's not only for plus size pop flyers, but for literally anyone, if there's extra seats on the plane, you can pay to have that seat be next to you. It's like 50 bucks, which I think is like a great, um, you know, compromise. Like I'll pay $50 to make sure that this extra seat is next to me, but I'm not paying for a full ticket because there's no point. So the only challenge with that is, is it requires that there's extra seats available to buy. Uh, I have not taken advantage of this specific deal so I'm not sure if you can call ahead and book it and get that $50 deal, or it really does have to happen, you know, in conjunction of so many days before the flight. But things to keep in mind, they do have some type of policy in, in line for that, which is not common in every other international airline. As far as international airlines I've flown that I've been able to fly without problem, but maybe do not exactly have a customer size policy, that would be Lufthansa, Turkish Airways, Aer Lingus, Singapore Airlines, and then Swiss. So all five of those I've flown have had great experiences, but they don't technically have a customer of size policy. So, you know. And also Lufthansa has like those double-decker planes, which are super cool. So I would just buy them for that experience. So does Singapore Air. You actually, if you did not know that, some planes, they got seats on the bottom and seats on the top, and it's wild. It's wild. The next question I got was about the CPAP machine. I personally do not have a CPAP machine, so I had to do some research and I found out a lot. So hopefully this will help some of you that are traveling with a CPAP. It counts as a medical device. You can bring it on. It is not a carry on. It is just a piece of medical advice. So it doesn't count against your two items. Um, I saw several people suggest putting it in a clear bag so they don't take it out and dirty the parts uh, through the x-ray machine. You can just leave it in that clear bag and that keeps your machine hygienic. The last thing that I would suggest with a CPAP is several of you were discussing whether or not you can use a CPAP in flight internationally. And one of the tips that I saw that I thought was brilliant was to look at Seat Guru or other sites that you know give you advice about airline flights to see which flights have um, in-seat in outlets. With in-seat outlets, you should be able to operate your CPAP machine. Some airlines also require you to have a battery that lasts a certain amount of time of the flight. So I would again call that disabilities desk for what airline you're flying and just get your regulations for using your CPAP in flight. Again, you need to have that outlet and you might need to have some regulations by the airline. So the best thing to do is just call and get direct advice from the disabilities desk. They'll know exactly what you need and what you can and cannot have. But it is possible to use it in flight on long haul flights and you do not have to uh, take it as a carry on. It's considered just a medical device and does not count against your two items. When putting together this compilation video of travel tips, I realized that I actually have a CPAP now and I can speak more authentically to that experience. So I wanted to let you know in traveling with my CPAP machine, I've had absolutely no issues. I've flown domestically and internationally, both to the US, Europe, and in South America, and I've had absolutely no issue with my CPAP. It's treated not as a carry-on, but as a medical device, so it doesn't take up one of my two carry-ons. And it's been very simple going through security security checkpoints and everything else, literally no issues, no problems, and frankly isn't something you should be worried about when traveling.
Next, we're going to talk about mobility at the airport. This is a very big topic, which is just uh, wheelchairs and mobility in general and traveling. I'm going to cover a tiny bit of it in this video, but I think it really deserves a whole video where I'm actually going to reach out to some of my friends who are in wheelchairs full time to get a better perspective on it because I have used a scooter at Disneyland and a little bit through the airport when I've had various injuries, but I've never had it be such a permanent part of my life and I don't feel equipped to answer every single question about it. But what I will answer is if you're someone who is um, somewhat mobile, but not required to have a wheelchair, but maybe isn't able to walk to gate. Again, you're gonna call that disabilities desk and you're gonna ask for wheelchair transport. They will pick you literally up at the ticket gate and they will take you right through into your plane. Now, one thing to think about is they may not stop for food. They may not stop at the gift shop, just depends on who your wheelchair person is. So again, be nice to them. They might stop if you're nice to them and be prepared, maybe bring some snacks and stuff in case you can't stop before the gate. One thing to look out for is sometimes walking to the ticket counter can be long. So make sure you're having someone drop you off as close as you can to that ticket counter. So really your only long walk is to get into that ticket counter. Or if you have your own wheelchair, but you're not bringing it on the trip, have someone wheel you to the ticket counter and transition into their wheelchair whatever might happen there. Now, if you're bringing your own wheelchair, again, I'm not as experienced, but I am doing research and we'll have a whole video on that in the future, but that's what you can do if you're partially mobile. I will say do not rely on the carts. Um, the carts in airports are incredibly unreliable. They may or may not come. You can book them to pick you up, but they won't necessarily do it. It doesn't matter if you're injured and clearly need it, those things are completely unreliable. They, they are unschedulable. So don't say, oh, I don't need a wheelchair. I'm just going to take the cart. I have made that mistake and it was hell. Don't do it. Just get the wheelchair. They've dealt with all sizes of people and all sizes of wheelchair. They'll be fine taking you to the gate. Last thing we're going to talk about in this video. And again, this is all based on your questions. We keep them coming and we'll keep answering them. But everyone's asking about excursions. How do I book them? The first questions we had is about massages and spa experiences. All I'm gonna say is you can do those. I have never had a massage table I couldn't get on. Let's say some of them were a little bit smaller than I would have liked, but I've always been able to have a good experience with a massage, a facial, a body scrub, a body wrap, like anything spa-like, you're probably gonna be okay. The only thing you may not have is a robe. So I actually travel with my own robe so that I'm comfortable and that's not an issue. Then we're going to talk about theaters, concerts, and other shows. The most important part to have a good experience at a theater, concert, or other show is to call ahead. There are seats for bigger bodies. There are also seats for wheelchairs, and there are also bench seats in most concert, show, and venue, uh, other venues. If you don't call, you can't get those tickets. You can't look at a seating chart. Most of those tickets are not available for general purchase. They are saved for people who need them. So you need to call in and get those tickets. Good thing is, is they're often also closer. So it's a great experience if you do it. It's worth the call ahead to get a ticket that A, for you to get a ticket that's more enjoyable to watch the show in, but also B, because it might actually be a better ticket than you would have gotten anyway. So call in, get the help you need. Again, it's advocating for yourself. It's not a burden. And the last thing we're going to talk about, and again, I'm going to be doing a better video that's just for people who are in limited mobility or potentially in a wheelchair. We talked about how to pick activities and it really comes down to like three things. Know what you're capable of and underestimate it. It's better for you to pick an activity that's too easy than too hard. And it's also better to pick your first activity before you pick all your others. So I always like to do a starter thing to figure out how hard was that for me? And then I can make better judgments of what I can do for the rest of the trip. I like a couple different sites to find activities and get at this information and also chat with the host to find out if they're good for, for someone in my body. I love to use Viator. It has a ton of information, allows you to chat with the host, has ratings and reviews so you can read it. And then you're also kind of secured if you're nervous in a new country, it's a safe way to take a, a, a tour or a trip. The second place I love is All Trails. It's a hiking app if you're someone that wants to be outdoors and try different trails. All Trails will tell you the difficulty of the trail, how far it is, and also allow you to see pictures so you can kind of really assess if it's gonna work for you. 
I also love um, two other websites I love, are obviously TripAdvisor, another place to get reviews and ideas to do things, but also this site called Atlas Obscura. If you're like me and you like things that are a little bit weird in the world, Atlas Obscura has all kinds of unusual things to do in different countries and places. And many of them are a car ride away, meaning you don't necessarily have to be mobile to see them. So they're very interesting, unique, different things that you can see in cities that are often very accessible. So that is everything from your questions on our first video. And we have so many more videos like this planned. I'm just excited to help all of you travel more. When we launched this channel, we really wanted it to be about helping all different types of people travel. And one of the things we noticed on our Plus Size 101 and 102 travel videos is that there was a lot of questions about mobility, whether it be people who are unable to walk long distances, using a walker or a cane, or even using a wheelchair, or bringing their own wheelchair along. And we realized that this was a, a topic that's very nuanced and it needed its own video. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about traveling with or without a wheelchair and limited mobility. Now, small caveat, I am not an expert in traveling with um, a wheelchair or with limited mobility. I have some experiences in traveling with my stepmother who has been in a walker at various points of time and doing some travel in an electric wheelchair at things like Disney World when I had an injured foot. But by no means does this make me an expert on this subject. So what I did instead for this video is I did a lot of research up front, and then I also reached out to my friend Chelsea who is an expert at traveling with an electric wheelchair and she's gonna pop in this video from time to time giving pro tips from her personal experience and she's literally traveled all over the world with an electric wheelchair has all the great stories and all the horror stories and I think it's really gonna help round out this video for someone like me who hasn't experienced as much as her if you guys want to check her out links to all of her socials are down below and she is an amazing follow guys her content just brings me so much joy and also educates me a lot about what it's like to travel with a wheelchair. So with that guys, let's jump right into the video. Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea Bear and I wanna thank Anna for letting me be part of this video. Traveling with limited mobility is something that I share about a lot on my own platforms. And I think it's really important to have conversations like this to give people the resources that may have limited mobility to understand that travel is possible, but it of course takes a lot of extra planning, managing expectations, and just making sure you're prepared for certain things that can come up. So to give a little bit of insight about me personally, I have a disability that impacts the way I walk. It's called cerebral palsy, and I use a mobility scooter part-time that I call Scoots. So I can walk independently, but I usually use my mobility scooter for long distances, especially when it comes to traveling and navigating an airport. One thing we talk about in this channel that will be no exception in this video is that it is totally possible with a plan. And like any type of situation where you are traveling, planning is key. So let's talk about booking your flight. Unfortunately, the standards for booking a flight or traveling with a wheelchair or cane or walker are not consistent against each airline. But each airline does have a disability desk. You're gonna to wanna to call them as your first step in travel. They're gonna tell you about booking a flight, they're gonna tell you what options are available as far as pick up and drop off. If you're traveling with an electric wheelchair, they're gonna tell, tell you where you drop that wheelchair off and where you pick it up and how you get to the plane from that point onward. So there are two questions we suggest asking when talking to a disability desk. The first is, are there any policies or procedures you need to know about? when you're traveling with a wheelchair or other mobility device, such as a walker or a cane. They're gonna give you the real deal for their airline and help you be prepared. The second question is about battery package and storage. What are the requirements by that airline as far as what you can have? So you make sure that you get a battery pack through the check-in aisle and through your suitcase. Packing for someone with limited mobility is gonna be a little bit different than the average person. So candidly, we're all gonna pack our clothing and our skincare and our makeup, that's pretty standard. But when traveling with a mobility assistance device, you're gonna to wanna to think about packing backup batteries, extra charging cords, because if those things break in another country, you can't 
easily replace them and may not be able to get the right model for your vehicle. Additionally, you want to look at things like uh, tennis balls for your bottom of your walker as an extra piece just to prevent damage if you're traveling with a mobility assistance device. You also have to think about things like basic upkeep, like God forbid something breaks, how are you going to make it work? So things like zip ties, duct tape, little things just to manage your um, mobility device while traveling. Um, I'd love to jump to Chelsea right now. She's going to show us what she takes with us on a flight to give us a better idea of someone who actually travels with a wheelchair and what they bring with them or what they feel is necessary to bring with them. I'm going to share some of the things I do traveling with a mobility scooter on an airplane. And I wanted to start with the type of bag I bring with me and some of the things I personally do to prepare myself and my scooter while traveling on an airplane. So I recently started using a new backpack. This is from Jansport and it's actually a part of a new line they have that is an adaptive collection. So as you can see it kind of looks like a regular Jansport um, just at first glance but if you look closer if you do use a wheelchair or mobility scooter or a walker or whatever it may be there is a bunch of different ways that you can kind of hang this backpack on whatever your mobility device is. So if you have a wheelchair, here are two loops for the handles. Um, there's also a lot, of, this little handle here has a clip, so it's easy if you're not able to hold it and you need to clip it on and off. The straps are really adjustable. Also here, there's an extra strap if it needs to go over the back of a wheelchair or even a mobility scooter. And then there's just a lot of pockets, a lot of different compartments, and all of them have loops, um, easy to use and slide. Um, so it's been really helpful for me. I always bring a carry-on with me because there are certain things, even if I am checking a bag, that I want to make sure I have with me just in case my bag gets lost or delayed for whatever reason. So something I always bring with me on a flight, whether I'm checking a bag or not, is my charger for my mobility scooter. The last thing I want to do is make it to my destination, not have my bag, and then my mobility scooter die and there's no way for me to charge it. So this is something I always keep on me just in case I lose my bag. Um, another kind of pro tip, if you are traveling with your own mobility device, there are a lot of things that could potentially go wrong when it comes to the airlines dealing with it, moving it around. I thankfully have had pretty positive experiences for the most part, but I do like to keep everything on my scooter as condensed as possible when handing it off to the airline crews. So things that can easily be knocked off on my scooter, for example, my basket on the front, um, it really is easily just like taken off and put back on. So I usually remove that before giving that to the, the gate crew to bring it down to the bottom of the plane. And then another example here, I have this detachable cup holder that I put on my scooter that I always travel with. It's just helpful when I'm scooting to be hands-free. If I have a coffee, I could put it in my cup holder. But this is something, if they are getting a little rough with my scooter, it's super easy for them to knock off. So this is something I'll take off before boarding the plane and then put it in my carry-on just to make sure it's safe, doesn't get lost and uh, beat up. Some other essentials that I always carry with me on my carry-on are any medications I may need, any prescriptions, things like that that are really important for me to have, I make sure are readily available and on my person, so it's my responsibility. Another really great travel hack when it comes to traveling with a mobility device that I've been seeing some other people doing is duct taping instructions or directions on how their specific chair works. So for example, my scooter, the seat can come off, you just pull directly up, but if a crew member goes to lift my scooter, they may not know that. So I created kind of like a little cheat sheet of things that they should know that either can be touched and adjusted on my scooter or certain areas that absolutely should not be adjusted. Um, you know, and that can be for anyone specifically with a wheelchair that's specific to them. If they have a hand controlled device that absolutely cannot be impacted or broken because that would totally remove all function of the chair, they can include that on that cheat sheet and hopefully the people 
working with your scooter or wheelchair will reference that and can be a little bit more delicate when it comes to transporting it under the plane or wherever they may need to bring it. Again, with that vibe, I always talk about this with plus size clothing, you have to bring the things you can't buy in another country, right? And unfortunately for plus size, it's things like underwear, bras, and shorts. Well, when thinking about this in a mobility device, you might think about stuff like adaptable clothing, clothing that works with your wheelchair. It's probably gonna be very difficult to replace that last minute. So having those items or extras of those items with you is really important. You also might wanna look at other things that help support your body while you're traveling or transitioning from your wheelchair to your bed or to the bathroom or whatever it might be. So things like extra handles, pillows for support, and then honestly, adapters. This is one that I like didn't even think about, but if you have to charge your uh, wheelchair and you're in a foreign country and you don't have the right adapter, that could be a huge problem. And sometimes hotels just don't have them. So making sure you have the things you need to charge in a foreign country is really important. At the airport, unfortunately, if you're traveling with a mobility device, arrive early. People run late. There's other people that they're moving to and from gates. So you might have to wait a little bit and you don't want to be rushed. Additionally, we always say this, but pre-check is a great option. It helps you skip lines. Now for most airlines, if you are in a wheelchair or are being wheeled to the gate due to limited mobility, they will let you skip, but sometimes they don't. So having TSA pre-check just makes it easier on you because you know for sure you're not gonna have to just like sit there with somebody you don't know who's pushing you, which is always slightly awkward. Um, and from my personal experience with my stepmom, it's just easier to just go through a TSA. Now, Chelsea will talk a little bit about what she does at the airport to make it a little bit more smooth for her, and we'll jump to her now. So for me, the process, when I do arrive to the airport, I check my mobility scooter at the gate. So that way I can have it with me from as soon as I get to the airport, going through security, getting to my gate, navigating around the airport. If I do want to grab snacks or something before the flight, I have my scooter with me the entire time. And then before the flight, I go up to the flight attendants at the gate. I get a tag for my scooter that identifies that it's my mobility scooter and that wherever I land, they bring it back up directly to the gate so I have it as soon as I walk off the plane. There is an option for people with disabilities that do not have the ability to walk themselves. There are aisle chairs that a lot of people utilize. Um, and when it does come to boarding a plane with a disability, usually the airlines are pretty good about letting you pre-board so you can get on before anyone else and it's a little bit easier to navigate through the aisles without having to walk by a bunch of different people. Now, the flight. Please, for love of all that's holy, pre-board. It's just gonna be so much easier on you and you can do it. Honestly, why wouldn't you want to get on the plane early? You can make sure your carry-on actually makes it. Unlike me, who's stuck in the back praying that there's some overhead room up there for me. Actually, I pre-board too because I get two seats. But if I didn't, I'd be stressed about that for sure. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is restroom needs and planning for them. So if you know that there's no bathroom that is ADA accessible on the flight, make sure you go beforehand. Um, I've heard some people say that they wear diapers that's up to you, but it might be an option that works if there's no other option. And sadly, frankly, and I think this will be a little bit of the theme of the video and probably a little bit of what Chelsea chimes in on as well is that it's not perfectly accessible. And there are a lot of opportunities for growth in travel. And so you have to plan for your needs not being met. And that sucks. And I don't love that, but I wanna be honest about that in this video. Now, Long haul flights are supposed to, and again, supposed to being the keyword, have a handicapped bathroom. And if you have traveled um, and they, you know, your chair has obviously been taken away and gate checked, they are supposed to have a travel wheelchair to assist you to the bathroom. I want to say supposed to because I have seen horror stories of people that have not been able to get that wheelchair and have had to literally crawl to the bathroom. And that is terrifying. I don't wanna put that energy into the universe, but I also wanna be honest and upfront. For the most part, I've had pretty positive experience when it comes to traveling with my mobility scooter, but I know that that is not the case for a lot of people. And I think pretty much across the board, there's a huge opportunity for airlines and airports to better train their staff 
on how to assist people with disabilities, people with limited mobility, and then specifically anyone traveling with any kind of mobility device, whether that be a cane, walker, scooter, motorized wheelchair, whatever it may be. I've had a few experiences where I've landed and usually I let everyone else get off the plane because it takes them a little bit of extra time to bring my scooter up to the gate. So instead of me getting off and standing there and waiting for what could be 20 minutes, I let everyone else deplane while I sit and wait for the flight attendants to let me know that my scooter got there. So I've had a few instances where I've been stuck on the plane for upwards of 45 minutes to an hour. I would say that's the longest it's been. And while I am able to physically stand and walk off the plane myself, I've been told by the flight attendants that I should stay on the plane because once I'm off, then they don't really see it as an issue to escalate and try to figure out as quickly. So I've stayed on the plane in the past just while the ground crew is figuring out where my scooter is, how to bring it up in a timely manner. So that's always, of course, a little bit frustrating, but I think advocating for yourself while traveling with women in mobility is my number one piece of advice. After your flight, you're gonna pick up your device. Now walkers are typically kept on the plane along with canes, and then actual wheelchairs or electric wheelchairs are gonna be available in baggage claim. Before you leave baggage claim, check your vehicle. Make sure it works, turn it on, operate it. Do not leave that airport if something is broken, make sure you report it immediately because as soon as you get out of the airport, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get any type of, you know, help in managing broken parts or issues or things not working. I, of course, really hope this doesn't happen to anyone, but it is pretty common, unfortunately, where an airline can damage a mobility scooter or a wheelchair. So if you are ever in this situation, I think the number one thing you can do is advocate for yourself. I would let them know right away. I wouldn't leave the gate. Once you get your wheelchair and notice something is wrong, I would notify a team member of the airline. I would file a report. I would try to get in contact with the corporate office as soon as possible, take as many pictures as you can, document anything that's wrong. And from what I've heard from people who have had major issues with any kind of damage to their personal wheelchair. It can be a lengthy process trying to get any kind of response from them or a solution, but I would just continue to stay diligent, follow up with them, you turn to social media to, to share your story and hopefully have other people amplify um, anything that went wrong to hopefully motivate the airline to respond to you in a quick fashion. Um, but always just take pictures of what it is, document it, report it, and hopefully they will be cooperative and be able to offer a solution to you moving forward. So for hotels, in the US, it's pretty simple. Just ask for ADA compliant rooms. They should have handicap rooms in almost every hotel. And by calling ahead and speaking with someone there, you can make sure you have that room booked. International things get a little tricky because there are different policies for each country. So the easiest way to do this is to look on TripAdvisor or look on travel websites that cater specifically to those traveling with wheelchairs or limited mobility. And also ask about steps, terrain, and distance. Those are your three kind of things you're gonna be focused on. If there's steps, is there a ramp that you can get up on? Is the terrain rocky? Even if you are walking with a cane or a walker, like uneven terrain can be very difficult to manage. So make sure you're aware of that if it exists and how much of the course you'll have to walk is it part of, right? If it's a little bit, you might be able to do it. If it's a lot, it might be a complete no-go for the hotel. So when it comes to traveling with a disability or limited mobility of any kind, I am a huge advocate for saying planning in advance is super important. I went to Europe a couple years ago for the first time ever and going into it, I was really nervous about what was going to be accessible. You know, when you think Europe, especially as an American, you think of really old hundreds of years buildings and architecture that definitely wasn't created with people with disabilities in mind. So I was really nervous about that. So before traveling every city that I was going to, I looked up in advance what specific areas I wanted to go to. If there were any monuments or any activities I wanted to do, 
I looked and researched about the accessibility they had. And I also reached out in advance. Even if they said online they did have accessibility, I would email them, let them know I was coming. I have a mobility scooter. I would need a ramp or a lift, an elevator, whatever it may be, and try to talk to someone in advance. That way, if I did need to schedule an allotted time for someone to be there to either grant me access to an elevator or to a specific train car or route or boat with a ramp, whatever it is, usually having that little extra planning and communication with wherever you're going can really go a long way. And you know, when it comes to traveling, whether you have limited mobility or not, there's always gonna be things that don't go as planned. So I think just going into it, knowing you could plan the best that you can, but things are gonna go wrong, things are gonna change, but that's okay. I think that's the, the beauty of traveling. Not everything is always uh, perfect, but you adapt. I think people with disabilities or limited mobility have such a great way of adapting naturally. It's what we do, it's what we have to do. Uh, so I think whenever you're traveling, it's good to just kind of keep that in mind. And as long as you can manage your own expectations and whoever you're with, I think that you can always have a, some kind of a, a positive experience for sure. Now, you can always choose to make this whole process a little bit easier on yourself by booking through a travel accessible program. There was a great article written recently about six amazing travel accessibility programs that are basically organizing and designing travel for people in wheelchairs or with limited mobility. I would say personally, if it were me, this would make the whole process a lot less stress by allowing someone who's an expert to tailor and build your vacation for you. I know Chelsea has actually traveled with some of these programs, so I'm gonna cut to her for her to talk about some of her experience in traveling with some of these accessibility-focused travel companies. I'm so happy to see that there's so many new resources for people with disabilities or limited mobility when it comes to traveling. I think within the past five years, I've personally seen a huge wave of accessible travel companies. And it's been such a breath of fresh air and also really easy for me to start planning trips more often than having to do all of the research from the beginning to the actual trip. Um, you know, there's a lot of advocates out there that are sharing their stories, sharing the different places that they visit and the accessible things they've done, which is a great resource. And then there's companies that plan accessible trips from every aspect, whether you have a wheelchair or limited mobility or you use a walker or you can walk but need to take a few stops every couple steps, whatever it is. Um, so. There is one company that I recently traveled with. I had a great experience with them. They're called Wheel the World. They have kind of a, a very unique story. One of the founders was paralyzed at a young age due to an accident. And him and his best friend founded this company because they love to travel. And they thought even though one of them was disabled, why should that not allow us to travel anymore? So they have a really unique story, a really passionate one that they just want to help people of all abilities travel. And I was very grateful to go on a trip with them recently to Costa Rica. And I used my mobility scooter the entire time, everything from transportation to the hotels and resorts we stayed in, to all of the activities we did, even going to the beach, getting in the water, everything was accessible. They either had notified places beforehand that we were arriving to let them know our accessibility needs. They had people that toured with the group with us that were well-versed in even getting a wheelchair onto a bus, things like that. So definitely an option for anyone who doesn't have the time to plan a trip, look into accessible travel companies. I think that it, it really just was such a weight off my shoulders going with a company like Will the World, knowing everything accessibility wise was taken care of. So all I had to really do was show up and enjoy the ride. Uh, so that would be something I definitely recommend looking into if you haven't already. Again, if you are going at this alone without a travel company at your back, make sure you pre-book transfers and that you practice with your travel companion if you're traveling with someone, how to break down and put together your vehicle so it'll fit in a car. This is something I never thought about until I traveled with an electric wheel wheelchair at Disney. And it is a process to learn how to break down a chair. So it sucks, but educating the person with you is 
probably your best bet and making sure you have more flexibility in where and how you travel around the country. When you're looking for activities and restaurants that are accessible, again, research on TripAdvisor, follow people like Chelsea who are experts at traveling with a disability. They're gonna talk about places they visit and you can find great locations by looking at their social media. It's a win. Also, those tour groups are great resources and honestly, something that I am so grateful exists, but you're gonna have to, again, what's the word? Plan. I would also say something that's been really great for me in traveling with my stepmom who has a walker is she really loves bus tours. In some locations, it's very difficult to actually access different buildings or landmarks, but you can see them from a bus quite well. She was able to see a lot of places in Shanghai that she wouldn't have been able to walk to off of the top of the bus. It took a little maneuvering to get her up there, but then we stayed for like two hours and she had an amazing experience and didn't feel like she was missing out on some places. So buses are an option. Obviously, I would prefer for those locations to be accessible, but part of traveling with a disability unfortunately is, and this is just the reality, and, and obviously making videos like this hopefully will help change that reality, is that not all of them are accessible. So finding ways to at least experience those locations, buses are a good option. So the last thing we're gonna cover in this video is where is it the easiest to travel with a disability? And I did not do this research. There was actually an amazing article written by CNBC that ranked countries by their accessibility. So I actually have linked that article down below. You can read all about the countries that are easiest, well countries, cities, places, that are the easiest to travel with a disability. Um, again, there is so much to cover on this topic and I am doing my best. I'm really grateful for Chelsea stepping in here and offering some pro tips and I'm sure there's things we still missed. That said, I do believe in a world where everyone gets a chance to explore and learn from each other, both culturally and just for fun. So y'all know I love Disney. And as a result, one of the questions I get all of the time is, is Disney plus size friendly? Is Disney accessible? What rides can I ride at Disney? And it really got me thinking a lot about um, how we make this channel useful. And what ended up happening is I was like, you know what? I wanna help you know if the adventure you're about to get yourself into is something you're gonna be able to do successfully. So John and I sat down and we came up with like a scale of a way for us to kind of rate different things about an activity, say for example, going to Disney. Um, so you can better be informed when planning your next adventure. So we're gonna actually introduce that to you today and we would love all of the feedback you can give us because again, this is our first shot. We may not have gotten it right. In fact, I'm fairly confident we didn't get it right because very rarely does anyone get anything perfect the first time. So we're gonna introduce you to what we call spilling all of the travel tea. T stands for terrain. How is the path? Is it clear? Does it have cobblestones? Are there scrambles? Is there any change in altitude? Is there hills, stairs, other things that get in your way that you have to like overcome in regards to the terrain? Ease stands for ease of participation. So this is gonna include things like climate. Is it super hot? Is it super humid? But also things like, is there places to sit down and take a break? Is there food and water nearby? Is there restrooms? Is there shade or is it full sun the whole, top, whole time? Can I step inside and get some air conditioning somewhere? Also with that will be things like pace. How fast does this adventure go? And then also physical. Do I need any extra physicality to do? So how easy is it for me to participate in this specific activity? Last is accessibility. And we're gonna be looking at things like, is it wheelchair accessible? Are there things that are, or boundaries that would prevent it from being accessible to some group of people? Is it size inclusive? Can you ride the rides? Can you fit the harnesses? Is it comfortable for someone in a bigger body? We'll also look at things like, weight requirements, and if there are stairs, are there ramps? And are there vehicles or support for people who might need a wheelchair in park or may choose to use a wheelchair? So I said in park because we're talking about Disney today, but that's our new scale, again, spilling all the tea on travel. And I thought for a first video, that because I literally just went, that Disney made the most obvious option. And this way, I'm not telling you whether it works for you or not, because I really don't like that. I really don't like telling anyone what they are and are not capable of, because 
Lots of people have thought I'm capable of far less than I actually am. Instead, I want to empower you with the information you need to make the decision that's best for you. We're going to rate these on a scale from zero to five stars, five stars being Oh my gosh, it met all the criteria, no matter what, this is gonna work. To one star being, please avoid at all costs, you may get hurt, even if you are the most physically active and together person. So let's get to spilling all the tea on Disney travel. So first, let's start with terrain. Disney is immaculately good at this. All of the roads are fairly smooth. All of the locations have entries for wheelchairs. There are no obstacles you're really gonna have to come across. Aside from a few hills and most of them in Animal Kingdom Park, most of the parks are fairly flat and easy to maneuver. However, when we talk about ease of participation, it's a little bit of a different story. Going to Disney, it really depends on what time of year you go. But during the most popular times, which happen to be the summer months, Disney is hot as hell. And it can feel like hell, literally, because 95 degrees and 85% humidity is a lot on the human body. So I would say in general, Disney is an awesome place to travel if it's not unbearably hot. So one thing you might wanna consider when planning a trip is if you don't do well with heat, think about that because it's gonna significantly affect your ease of participation and also just your ability to like keep going. Like I need a nap on the hot days, guys. I go back to my hotel room with the delicious AC and I cool down. I also know <laughs> lots of fun places to get AC at Disney. So one caveat to that temperature is there are lots of air conditioned places you can kind of step off for a little bit, cool down and then come back from. My personal favorite place to get AC is the China Pavilion in Epcot. It is ice cold, there are benches, and it's relatively quiet. So it's a nice like take a chill break spot within the park while recouping and getting your temperature back. But to be honest, as soon as you step back outside, it's still unbearably hot. Also, one thing to think about with that is there are a lot of parts of the park that are shaded. So you can also, if you don't have time to go in the AC or you're trying to walk through, you can try to avoid direct sunlight. Another alternative that's like a complete change of plans, if you want somewhere that's a little bit milder temperature all year round, try Disneyland. Being in California, it's got a little bit more of a consistent temperature and humidity, so it's better to plan for. Well, Disney World's weather can be pretty erratic and can be really, really hot and really, really humid and even rain at a drop's notice. In terms of pacing, Disney is a really go at your own speed type of place. And it's really what you make of it. Some people are power walking ride to ride and some people are leisurely strolling. Like I said, there's lots of places to sit down and relax. There's nice snacks and there's water pretty much everywhere, but it does come with a cost. You can also bring your water bottle and there is like water bottle refueling stations throughout the park. So if you don't wanna buy water, that's okay. You can just bring your own water bottle and refill there. I end up just buying water because I forget, to be honest, I just forget to bring my bottle. And then it gets exciting. <sighs> Why is buying water at a theme park exciting? I don't know. I guess I'm just, I'm just that girl. I'm just that girl who buys the water at the park. There really are places to sit everywhere. I used to joke with everyone that my favorite ride at Disney was Bench and that my second favorite ride was Bathroom because they're literally everywhere and I probably ride those two rides the most. But speaking of physicality, I should note that I have never gone into a Disney park and walked less than five miles. Even when I was not seeing the whole park, just going to part of the park, only going for part of the day, I have never successfully made it out of the park with less than five miles on my Apple Watch. And this is for a lot of reasons. First, getting from how you arrive at the park to the actual inside of the park is a bit of a distance. Additionally, if you're staying on property, all of the hotels have a fairly, fairly long walk to the bus. Well, some people would say it's short, but I think it's pretty long when I'm exhausted at the end of the day. Just factor that in that there is quite a bit of walking from the car to the front of the park and from the park to uh, wherever they drop you off to your hotel room. Um, if walking is a concern for you, there are electric wheelchairs that you can rent once you arrive in the park, but they do go pretty quickly. On average, for me, a normal day at the park is eight to 10 miles walking. So keep that in mind when you're planning. If that number sounds outrageous to you and you can't fathom doing that and you feel like you're gonna need support, We'll talk about that in this next section, which is accessibility. Disney is extremely wheelchair friendly. I know I've already said this 
in the beginning of this video, but they go above and beyond. Almost all the rides have um, special entryways for wheelchairs. All the staff are trained on how to guide you through. There is minimal walking. If you need help transferring from the chair to the ride and from the ride back into the chair, you can literally go with no walking. I personally went in an electric wheelchair when I had a busted foot and I had you know, really minimal walking I could do and I had an amazing experience. You do not get to magically cut the ride. That is a myth. I wanna shut that down now because I feel like it leads to people um, putting actual people who need wheelchairs at a disadvantage by demanding special treatment. You will probably still have to wait in line. It might be a slightly different line because you have a wheelchair, but it's not like a magical fast pass to the front. That is not true. That is a rumor. That is not truth. What I will say, and I mentioned it just slightly before, is that there are wheelchairs in parks. So if you get exhausted and you need to get one, you might be able to get one. And I say might because on a busy day, they go fast. So what I did instead, and it worked really great for me, and honestly was only about $150 for the whole week, was just to rent one from a local vendor. It was available at my hotel when I arrived. I literally rode it on all the transportation to the parks, the monorails, the boats, the um, Skyliner, every single one of them works seamlessly with a wheelchair. So you can literally just take your wheelchair from your hotel to the park, that way you're guaranteed you have one. If you decide you wanna go without it one day, you can leave it at the hotel and then you can come back and get it if you need it. I just think it gives you a lot more flexibility. Also with um, the wheelchairs and along with the strollers in case you're pushing kids and just, or just want something to hold on you to give you balance after your body starts to deteriorate from too much walking, they can't leave the park they're in. So if you're park hopping, that can get real messy real fast. Again, if you have your own, then you can take your wheelchair from park to park to park to park. But if you're in like, let's say Magic Kingdom and you wanna hop over to Hollywood Studios or Epcot, you're gonna to have to get a new wheelchair at that new location and hope that there's still one there for you to get. So we just covered that the park is super accessible for people who are in a wheelchair, but what about those of us with bigger bodies? Now, I would say the park is about 90% there. Most of the rides, I would say, literally 90% of the rides are plus size friendly to an extreme. Um, no discomfort, long seat belts, big seats. You maybe have some hitting on the sides if you're bigger hipped, but really great in terms of accessibility. Also, I would say that the cast members there are trained on how to deal with situations with larger travelers. So they're not gonna like shove four people in next to you. For example, when I ride Rise of the Resistance, I usually don't have a fourth person in the car and that's just for my comfort. I don't wanna disturb that person and I've never had to ask for it. It's just something that the Disney cast members have done seamlessly. And I think that is a really important part of being plus size accessible is making sure that a person can just enjoy their day and doesn't feel called out or like they're having a unique experience because of it. It's all very quiet and very discreet and nothing is ever said to you. And I think that's, that's just, it's just really well done. There are some rides that don't work for bigger bodies. Mind Train comes to mind, Flight of Passage, Passage and Tron for people with larger calves. I had problems with Garden of the Galaxy because I have such wide hips. Now I know a lot of other people wrote it and we're fine with it. What I will say is there is no definitive guide of whether your body will fit this ride. And I've seen um, a lot of people do reviews of the parks and declare certain rides plus size friendly and then not be able to ride that, AKA Guardians of the Galaxy for me, which sucked, it was not a great experience. What I will say is this, all of that research is a really great basic understanding of the ride. You will not know 100% sure on those specific, more challenging to bigger body rides until you try. So it's really up to you whether you try or not. I've seen people my size get on Flight of Passage because they have smaller calves. And obviously I've seen people bigger than me who hold their weight up higher ride Guardians of the Galaxy. It just really depends on how your body's distributed. That said, Pammy Parks does amazing reviews on each of the rides. And while you can't be certain for sure her review of it being plus size friendly or not is going to be accurate for your body, you can at least understand how the ride works and make a better judgment about whether it'll work for you. That's, that's my only caveat because I think for me, it was really heartbreaking when I read, oh, Guardians of the Galaxy works for plus size bodies, works for everybody, and then it didn't work for me. And I felt even shittier, for lack of a better word, because I felt like now I was not even in the plus size community. I was like in some other world. And 
I don't want to do that to you. I think that bodies are weird and bodies are, and I say weird as in like not a negative thing. We're just different. We're all different. And you're really not going to know what works for your body until you, you put it in that situation. So make your choices wisely about that and go with someone you love who can support you if it doesn't work out. When I couldn't ride Guardians of the Galaxy, it was kind of, it was embarrassing and I didn't feel great about it. But the cast members were super discreet about it. There was no like, hey, this girl can't fit. It was just very like, hey, you want to get up and go out? I just acted like I was scared. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm so scared. Which was a great, great cover up or a terrible one. I am i don't know. I can't read everybody's minds around me. And I had a really good friend with me and she was like, we just went on with the park the rest of the day as if it were normal. We didn't focus on that moment. So I say, if you are nervous about fitting a ride, just make sure whoever you're going up to that ride with is someone you feel really comfortable with who can support you if it doesn't work out. Like I said, 90% of the rides are perfectly fine. And the rides that tend to be more challenging are the more thrill rides. So if you're looking for a category to exclude, anything that's super thrill ride will may, may be the issue. But again, it's not a blanket statement because um, Thunder Mountain, that's fine. Works perfectly fine. Everest, that's fine. And those are technically thrills. So check out Pammy Parks and also just be prepared to, to take it on the chin if something doesn't work out and make sure it's worth your mental sanity to fight for it. That's it. So if I had to rank all of this according to the T, I would say terrain is pretty much a five out of five. It is super easy to get around and is really designed for accessibility. The ease of participation. I'm giving this a three out of five. People come back from Disney exhausted for a reason. And I think going into this experience, not realizing that is how a lot of people have bad Disney trips. So if it feels overwhelming, just plan ahead and get a wheelchair. Then that bumps you up to like five out of five because it removes a lot of that stress that you have from all of the walking and all of the strenuous activity in the sun. Last, we have the accessibility. I'm giving this a four out of five. Disney does a great job at being accessible to both people in wheelchairs and people in bigger bodies, but there's still some rides we can't fit. Now, I don't know if that's things that could have been changed with the design or not, but it's something to keep in mind that is an obstacle. Not every single ride is gonna fit. That said, comparing a Disney park to like a Universal park, you will be able to ride a considerable amount more of rides at Disney than you would ever be able to ride at those parks. So I think for the most part, for an amusement park, they're probably a five out of five, but for a general score about everything, that they're like a four out of five. I hope that gives you more insight when you're planning your Disney trip on what may or may not work for you, what to plan ahead for, and what to be prepared for emotionally. I hope it helps you decide whether a Disney trip is right for you, and if so, how you want to enjoy that trip, whether it be walking or using a mix of walking and a scooter or just a scooter by itself. However you want to go, I hope you feel more informed and more prepared to visit the House of Mouse. And with that, guys, I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Go out and see the world. Peace. Welcome to Calabria, and we're snorkeling today. Let's get into it. Okay, so we are slowing down and we're pulling up to like a little inlet area and we're gonna go snorkeling. So, it's like, I love snorkeling. I love being in the water. I feel like a fish. That's why I like do not get offended when people call me a whale sometimes because I'm like, wow, I do love the water and I am very smart. It makes sense. Okay, so I was like a little nervous. I always am nervous with snorkeling because you know, I'm a big girl and the ladders can be like really small. But these are like really sturdy, heavy duty ladders, which I'm really excited about because that means there's gonna be no like issues with me getting in and out of the water. I will say, do know you have to get up and out um, using a ladder which means if you don't have the upper body strength, keep that in mind if you choose to go snorkeling or not. We're on the southwest side of Culebra. This is called Tamarindo Bay. Over here in Culebra, we have a lot of fire coral, which are all the bright colors that grows oh, underneath. That hurts. If you happen to get too close, that you touch it, you rub it against your skin, you will notice quickly why they call it fire coral. Uh -huh. Okay, so we're about to go into the water and they gave us a whole bunch of warnings. Don't go too far, don't touch the coral. 
Someone said there were sharks. I know that's a lie, but I'm still nervous. I'm still nervous and uh, don't drown. So that's my task for today is to not drown and to make it out without hitting a fire coral. Um, this is my snorkeling mask and I'm gonna go get the little stuff in it that defogs it and I'm gonna get in the water and we're gonna enjoy this beautiful water here at Calubre. 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 <laughs> um, and this is just our first stop on a whole adventure today. So I'm excited. I love getting in the water. Getting in the water is like my favorite thing. Seriously. Love. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the one saving you. You're not, gonna, something you're not gonna have to save me. Okay. I'll save my damn self. <laughs> I don't need a prince. Yeah. Oh yeah, that would have been rough. It's baby soap, but still would be rough. Yeah. I mean, it's already gonna be rough. Ready. What if I just walk through life with this on? What? I'd never get anything in my eyes. Yeah, you're not gonna. You have to put put this uh, strap a little bit higher than your ears. You're gonna pull <laughs> this strap, this one. Oh, that one. And the other. One. No, no, no. Oh. Two at the same time. Let's get it loose again. <laughs> He's like, no. this girl's a mess. <laughs> Where's the other one? Let me help you. Let me help you get it. <laughs> okay. Now pull them both at the same okay. time. This was a little bit towards, looser, so I just... Towards the back of your I think head. it's good. If you have this option, you're good. Oh, I'm sucked in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these are some sturdy stairs. Bitch can climb these. You know you get your fears, because like, sometimes you get on these boats and they've got like a tiny metal rod that you know is hollow inside. I'm like, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die coming up these steps. You're not gonna die today. It's really cold though. I just want to throw that out there. Okay. okay. Okay, it's cold. You lied about the water temperature. That was a hard lie. Hard lie. It is not warm. This might be a bad idea. Um, I'm in the water. I have a GoPro. This is our first time using this, by the way. And I'm going to take you snorkeling with me. Uh, things to note. If you are not a good swimmer, they do have like uh, little things you can wrap around your waist. If you're a bigger girl, you're actually just going to float a lot easier. So you may not need it at all. So I don't need it right now. We are pretty close to the beach, but I have no one around me, which is kind of crazy. Now I'm going to flip this around and show you what we, what we got underwater. because I try to be like uh, impressive and go to water and I'm not impressive. I'm not an impressive scuba -er. I'm having fun. I have no clue how this is going to turn out. This, this footage might be a total shit show. But you know what? Not an expert. Yeah, this is easy actually. Oh, and I love that they have these. Yeah. That's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not hard at all. A little Sammy Sam. I'm going to eat this and then I'm going to try to sneak back in. So I got to like take it fast. I'll make it. I'll just wander so far from the boat that they have to wait for me to come back. Nobody heard that, right? So we're leaving snorkeling. We are going to our next spot and I am eating a galleta, which is a cookie. Andre! <laughs> Okay, so we are just about to dock at Flamenco Beach. And this dude's got to swim down and like anchor it himself. Uh, he's like very proud. Look at him like just peacocking over there. See him? He's peacocking behind me. So I walked to the beach, right? <laughs> Sorry. I walked to the beach, but then I decided I just wanted to be in the water. So I'm just floating here with this giant pad and living my best life because we come to these things to relax, right? <laughs> An amazing time in Puerto Rico. We always talk about the tea of travel, right guys? So we're talking about the terrain. It's very easy to get on a boat. The people on this boat are very helpful. We got Jamila and Kathy, and they are good people. They will help you on the boat. Uh, we're gonna talk about environment. It is hot as hell. So uh, you can sit in the shade, but it's still gonna be hot as hell. The boat does have wind when you're driving though, so that helps a lot. And it is humid, so it is, it's just hot. There are, Hold on, wait for it. Don't bring me back, I swear. There are sandwiches and food and stuff you can have here. Kathy is a pro at getting you whatever beverage you need. 
She's making sure that you are hydrated. And then for activity level, it's up to you. You can stay on the boat and do nothing. You can get in the water and snorkel and swim. Uh, it's really set your own pace. This is like anybody can do this one. As long as you can deal with heat. Just bring sunscreen. Whoa! The universe collided and wanted me to tell that up close. Wear sunscreen. Oh my God. Oh, okay, this is going down a, a path of, we're good, we're good, we're good. We're just gonna get away from the boat. You know what? You know what? This this is this is my life. That's this, how you have to get on, on the mat. This is how you can get shade in Puerto Rico. Is you just get under the mat. Okay, I'm getting out, I'm getting down. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Okay, y'all need to see how freaking clear the water is because it's ridiculous. Like, um, this apparently was one of the like best beaches in the world before the hurricane. And then the hurricane kind of like screwed it up a little bit, but it's now back to being one of the best beaches and the water is like insane. Chad started swimming and he started screaming, I'm swimming, you gotta film me. So, yes you do. So I have this theory that there's two types of people. You're either like a beach person or a water person. You either want to sit on the beach and look at the water or you want to be in the water and look at the beach or at more water. I am 100% a water person. So like we could walk to the beach and I did walk to the beach earlier, but I just want to sit in the water and soak it up. I think sometimes when we visit places, I don't get to do what I love the most because I'm always thinking about everybody else. And today I'm being a little selfish and I'm thinking about myself and what I enjoy most, which is the water. And I think what's great about this trip specifically is that you can stand in the water. So if you're not a strong swimmer, you can just come and enjoy the water in a way that's totally safe. And a lot of excursions I take that are water-based, that's not the case. You have to be somewhat of a stronger swimmer. This is a great excursion for someone who is not a swimmer at all, actually. I mean, I saw a girl walk down to the beach carrying two drinks off of the boat. That's how easy it is to walk from the boat to the beach. And uh, yeah, so that's another thing I just want to point out is it's like, it's just a really great tour. Honestly, <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun. And that's why I'm like, can I just stay in the water and just keep living my best life? We're heading back. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm sunburned, but I had a good day. <laughs> Oh, this has been amazing. <laughs> Hug me, Kathy. Of course. Oh, you were great. <laughs> Thank you. I hope to see your video, okay? You have to leave your video. We'll link it to you guys, I promise. Yes. Thank you. Done and done. Okay, so we finished the day. We are headed back to the hotel now. I am definitely sunburnt, but I am so happy in my heart because I had so much fun today. Met a lot of amazing people. I learned a lot of really interesting stories about how they met and how they came together. And it just reminded me that good people find good people. So if you feel frustrated or stressed out in the world today, you'll find your people. Just give it time. Keep being good. Keep being kind. Remember that, guys. Remember, always go out and explore the world. I'll see you later. Peace. Thank you guys so much for watching this compilation. I hope to help some of you feel a little bit more at ease when traveling this holiday season. I love helping empower other people to go out and see the world. So yeah, hope you have a wonderful holiday season and that this helps you get wherever you wanna go to celebrate the season.